don't want to live in sin because sin stinks. Sin, that's the easiest word I could think of. Sin is just not good for you. But not only that, I, he wants me not just to not sin so I miss the bad, but he wants me to have some, not just righteousness, but he wants me to have peace. How many of y'all need some peace in your life? Oh, I counsel y'all. Y'all need some peace in your life. We all need it from time to time. Things get out of whack. We need peace in our home. We need peace with our kids, peace in our marriage, peace in our bank account sometime. But not only that, he said, but you need to have, you can have some joy. Amen. We're supposed to have some joy. And he said, in my presence, there's fullness of joy. Gary said it a while ago when the Lord spoke to him and said, I am the need that you need. I'm what you need. You see, and that leads right in. It's in his presence there's a fullness of joy. Joy is not just happiness. Happiness is based on happenings. Happiness is what's happening around you. It's very hard to have happiness when your plumbing's leaking in the backyard. We know that wasn't just water in his backyard. Life has that stuff. But you know what? Even in the middle of the stinky things, even in the middle of the bad things, I can still have joy because joy comes back down to I am a child of God and there's nothing too hard for him. And he promised me, Romans 8 and 28, he said, you can know this thing. You can know that all things will work together for the, for, for the good to those who love me, those who love God, those who've been called according to his purpose. That word call means you've been invited to come and do his purpose. And so when you say he invites you, he calls you, you need to say yes. See, I believe you have an option. I believe you can say no. I believe we have a will because I, you've heard me say, I don't think yes, yes really doesn't have any meaning if no is not an option. Yes has no meaning if no is not an option. He wants us to choose. He wants us to say yes to his invitation to love him back. And to find out what his purpose is every day in your life. Every day he wants us to find out. And so uh, I was, uh, boy, this, I was just reading. I was just reading for me, not studying. But one day earlier uh, last week and a scripture, I turned up my Bible and I had some things underlined. And I may have preached on this before. I don't remember, but it, it just jumped out at me. And it's Mark uh, 2 and 1. Mark 2 and 1. He said, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. Boy, that jumped out at me. Noise. Other places says it was noised abroad. Jesus comes here, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway, that means quickly, right off the bat, Many were gathered together, insomuch there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word to them that they, they came to him bringing one sick of the palsy. And it goes on this whole story about this man getting healed. But right here, he was in the house. Can you say, Jesus in the house? See, what I want them to say, people want to talk about Christian gathering, this little house. We're going to talk about the physical house here, even this little building when we gather together. I want people to say when they talk about Christian gather to say Jesus is in that house. And when he is in the house, people uh, will start gathering together. Because, because why? Because they noised it abroad. People started going telling their friends. They started telling their family. They ran into somebody who had a child addicted to drugs, maybe. They ran into somebody who just got a diagnosis of a stage four cancer or, or whatever stage four. It's not fun. It's, 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 a, it's a terrible demise. And so at some point, people started talking and saying, hey, we know where Jesus is. And he said there were so many, they started coming. They started bringing the sick. They started bringing their friends. In fact, this is the story. There were so many people, they couldn't even get near the door, he said. They were out the windows, out the doors. They were hanging out because Jesus was in the house. Let me tell you something. When you've got Jesus in your house or in your church, uh, you don't have to beg people to come. You don't have to manipulate with programs. You don't have to start having some little scheme how we're going to, not, not that it's bad, but trying to make a program, everyone, each one, reach one. We're going to double our numbers. We're going to double our budget. We're going to, because that's what religion starts doing. We start trying to build him a house. When he said, I don't need you to build the house. He said, upon this rock, I will build this house. I will build it and the gates of hell's not going to prevail. It's going to be my house. He said, he added daily to the church those that should be saved. 
He said, if you're laboring, you can labor in vain if he's not building it, unless the Lord build the house. But when God, when Jesus is in the house, you cannot help but have people want to start gathering. And because what's going to happen, you're going to get changed. You're going to get changed. And then people are going to see that he's in your house. Because now on this side of the cross, on that side of the cross, he was in the physical house with his sandals and his robes. And people came to get healed. But now this side of the cross, where is he? The kingdom of God is in man. He said, this is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now when he gets in your house, does people know he's in your house? I'm telling you, when you get full of the Holy Ghost, when you get full of His Spirit, you don't have to go around telling anybody, I'm a Christian. You don't have to tell them. You might be in a place in your work, or you might be in a place where you cannot talk about God or religion or those things. You don't even have to because all of a sudden there has been a miracle change. The lights came on. Before that, the, the house was there, but there was nobody home. The Spirit wasn't there. You were dead in your trespasses of sin. But when He comes in your house, all of a sudden people know it. And what happens, he draws people to you. He draws people to your church. They can talk about this house. They can talk about this church and say, oh, they have comfortable pews. They have great music. Uh, hopefully they can say you have some good preaching. But the issue is all those things are to do one thing. It's to get you to him. It's to get his spirit. It's to get you in the house where all of a sudden you're not, he's just not here, but you're aware. You are actually not missing the master. The name of my message today is not missing the master. Because the reality is he can be in your city and you can miss him. He can be in your, your family, you can miss him. He can be right in front of your face and you can really miss him. And I'm reminded of the story that last week, last week Brother French uh, t taught us. Y'all remember what he taught about? We won't tell him if y'all don't remember. Let's think about it. Talked about a dinner, a supper. Made us all hungry. We had to try to hurry. We all wanted to hit babes or somewhere after church. But he talked about the parable where there was a man who made a dinner. He made a feast. He had prepared that feast. He worked hard. He talked about how he worked. You don't just make a feast. You don't cook Thanksgiving dinner one hour before time, do you? You buy the turkey, you thaw the turkey, you get up early and put the turkey on, and, you, and everybody, somebody's going to bring this, somebody's going to bring that. Our family, we all bring our stuff together. Everybody brings your favorite dish, and you have a feast. And he talked about that there had been a feast made, prepared, and then he sent out the servants and said, he sent out the invitations. They didn't have, you know, uh, email and, and, and invites, evites and all like that. They went out and they invited the people to come. And, and you know who he was inviting. It's pretty obvious that he's inviting his family and friends. He was inviting the people that would, would normally come to, to daddy's house. And we found out that when, when they invited them to come, they went out and said, we got this prepared. And they were so consumed with their own life. They were very distracted with things of life. It, I noticed that story. It didn't say they were out sinning. They weren't out partying up. They weren't out doing any. They weren't out there just, no, they were doing life. One man said, I've got some ox. I've, I've got some cattle I've got to go handle. Another person said, well, I bought some land. I've got to go out and deal with that. These are legitimate things, right? Another person said, I just got married. Ooh, you know how that is. I just took a wife. Ooh, we got some stuff to do. Not all that's good. He wants us to have cattle. He wants to have business. He wants us to have spouses. All those things are good. But they got so distracted with life that they missed an invitation to come and to eat and to fellowship. See, we use this scripture many times to talk about going out and inviting the lost to be saved. But the reality is this story was to the church, the church of that day. He was talking to Pharisees. It says he was at their house. He was talking. It tells you who he was talking to. And he's telling them the story about how th this whole thing. And, and he's making a, 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 a point to them. This is a parable. A parable is an analogy because he was trying to show them something. He was telling them that I have come to my own. I am come. I'm one of your brothers. I'm a fellow Jew. I'm speaking to you. And I'm right here in front of you. And you're missing the whole point. I've prepared a meal for you. I have got all this prepared. I've got a new covenant where you're not going to have to rely on the old law. It's not going to be tooth for tooth and eye for eye. I've got this whole new kingdom for you. 
But they were so wrapped up in doing what they'd always done, doing life, is, is, that they missed the master. They missed out on the opportunity to come and dine with him, to come in and eat this, what has been prepared, and also to fellowship with the other people. How many times as a church we miss out on really meeting with the master? Because the truth is you could actually come to church and still miss the master. You can come to church and sit on your pew and come and leave and not even be changed. You can sit right there and come in with your head so full of whatever happened on the way to church. I don't know about y'all, but for some reason, on the way to church is the ideal time for me and Gary to have an argument. <laughs> it used to be about, what? You didn't put the bow in her hair? I laid out the bow. I just noticed today, J.C. lost her bow before she ever got to church. Don't tell Joda, J.C. was here without a bow on. I've got my grandkids. She's like fanatic about it. But I was too. I guess I passed that on to her. Isn't it something how you can come? You can be on your way to church and get distracted by things. Just what are we going to eat? Who did this? Did you do that? Do that? And all of a sudden you can come in this house. And the worship can start. And before you know it, you're over there worrying about this. You're worrying about that. You could even be up here doing music and miss it. You could be doing sound and miss it. You could be a greeter and miss it. Because you get involved with whatever you're thinking of that day. And you forget that you came here to dine, to eat something for you, to get something. And also to be able to fellowship with brothers and sisters. To come in here and not get distracted. Because let me tell you something. Y'all know this. It's difficult out there. You're going to leave here. If you're a mother, you've got kids to do this week. We're thinking about back to school. We're thinking about school supplies. We're thinking about how we're going to afford this, how we're going to do this. Or the sports has been too much. If we've got fathers, we're over here, and we're thinking about our jobs. We've got these things. And all of a sudden, we can come in the house and not even eat. You can come and leave without even getting in his presence and really getting what you need. Now, we know getting in his presence is not about just coming to church, don't we? Okay, this applies. We can go further. It's really what we do every day. We can miss the master. But even in the church, we can get so distracted coming that it becomes routine. It becomes something we do. The song's like, well, I love that song. Or, oh, well, they're going to do that song again. That drums are too loud again. They weren't. You sounded awesome. Thank you, brother. I saved myself on that one. <laughs> brother, I pray you might, brother David, he said, I don't like to play drums today. I get to just sit here and just relax. And, and I, you know what? There's a lot of, a lot of, y'all know, there's a lot of preparation that happens before you get to just walk in the church and sit down. If you're not out there greeting somebody, you're not, you didn't get here an hour early, you didn't drag your kids here an hour early to practice music and singing. You know what? There's preparation that goes on. It's like preparing a meal. And there's a lot of people today didn't even come. At this here, this is part of the meal. But I just want to say, don't miss the master because that's exactly what the Jews did. They got so busy doing, they missed what he said. And what's interesting, because he was talking to them, now he was giving them an analogy. He was saying, I've called you first. I've come to the lost house of Israel. I've called you to come and dine. You're my people. And then he goes on, he said, but they did not come. They didn't come. So he said, you know what I'm going to do? He actually said he was angry. Do you know God gets angry? Mm -hmm. This is an analogy. It's a parable. He's using the father here is, is, is the one. He said he was, he was angry and he said, um, where am I at here? Anyway, he just said, you just go out. He said, I want you to go out and get the haunt, the, the, the halt, the lame, the maimed, the, 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 all these people. I thought I, it's not the right one I've got in front of me. Oh, I know I changed the deal. But anyway, he said, also go out to the highways and the byways. Say, that's me. Those people that had, that were, had all these issues, they were issues. They were blind. They were lame. He said, just go get the people with issues. Say, that's me. I have issues. My sister said, I think they may have had a t-shirt, said, I have issues. Follow us to our church. Just follow me. I got issues. We, I, I'm going to probably, I don't know if that was really hers or I'm going to steal it or whatever, but we could all say that. He went out. He said, you know what? I'm going to go out. And it's the picture of him saying, I'm going to leave the Jews who did not come and I'm going to turn to the Gentiles. A bunch of messed up folks. As people, he said, you just go out to the highways, go out and get strangers. That's us. We're the broken and we're the strangers. And he said, go get them. It was the church folks of the day that missed him. He said, now I'm going to go. And he said, let me tell you this. He said, those that did not come, 
they will not enter this kingdom. He said, they're not going to. He said, even though, let's go back a little less than him. We're remembering he was talking, this is before the cross, right? Before he had died, he was talking only to the Jews. He's talking to them. And um, he said, I came to you and, and, and uh, you, didn't, you didn't receive me. So he said, um, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to uh, uh, give this new covenant to these people who will receive me. They're not going to be of the lineage of Abraham. They're going to be people who's just going to choose me and, and it's going to come to me because uh, I have called them. And oh, he said, oh, I was going to say right here. He said, the covenant to Abraham was is that your descendants will be as the sand of the sea. That was the promise he made. That was the first covenant. And I'm going to give you Israel and give you a country. I'm going to make you a mighty nation. And, and he did that. And he's still there today. He said, even though Israel be as the sand of the sea, there's only going to be a remnant that's going to be saved out of them. He said, I'm only going to save a remnant. There's only going to be, I'm going to fulfill my promise. You're going to be a sand of the sea, but there's going to be people that I'm going to elect out of this side, and I'm going to bring them into this side. And he tells us why. He's told them there, he said, you are not coming because you don't love my father. It's always been a heart issue. He was looking at them. He said, I've been trying to get you to come. He said, but you don't recognize me? One place he said, he looked at him. He said, you seek the scriptures. That was the Old Testament. He said, you know it. He said, you think you have eternal life in those scriptures? He said, but those very scriptures that you're reading about are the ones that's telling you about me. He said, you're telling you that I'm coming. And they still missed him. He said, you're reading the scripture. You're so caught up in your doctrine. You're so caught up in all the little dot in your eyes, crossing the T's. You're so caught up in that that you miss the very one that Isaiah told you about and Jeremiah told you about. All these prophets were telling you that I was coming and you're missing me. And I'm right here. Because you, he said, you, I guess he knew their hearts, that they lost their love of the Father. And you know what they did? They become lo loving of their positions. This is how, you want a downfall? You get built up in pride. I've seen many preachers, many people that did a great work. All of a sudden, they get caught up in what they're doing. Whether they're the song leader, whether they're the head of Sunday school, whether they're the head pastor. What, you can get so caught up in those things. And look at this, that you miss him. He said, the very scriptures you're memorizing in the Torah and all these things you're memorizing, all of them's talking about me and I'm standing in front of you and you're missing me. You can come to church and he can be right there and meet your needs and come in this house and leave without your needs met. Because you are, you've got your mind, you're missing him. We should come in here. It's all about him. The minute, well, before they ever start singing, I need you. Getting up in the morning before I ever come to church, I need you. I need to meet with the master. I don't want to miss you today. I could get up and try to do everything right. Get my kids' homework done. Get to work on time. Live right. Walk right. Speak right. Trying to get all the do's and don'ts. And get so hung up in that that I miss him. And then I don't have the joy. Because he said, in my presence, there's fullness of joy. And if you don't have joy, he said, you don't have strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. If you're feeling weak, this is a key. You need to get in his presence. Seek his presence. Find a way to get together with him and his people. That's what that meal was about. It wasn't just to a person. It wasn't just dining with him, but it was dining with each other. Do you know we need each other? This morning, our little group, when we get here early, we stand up here and, and um, Joseph had some things to say. And he said, and then somebody else said, they heard what somebody else said. They were like talking to each other, going, I remember what you said. Sister Robin had said something. And they said, I've been eating on that. I think it was Brother Gary said, Robin has been saying something. Y'all, it's not just about the preachers. You are all just as important. You all have something to do and say. This is why you need to find ways to get together. Well, our Monday night is the opportunity to get together. It's a night that we, not everybody can come, thank God. My house ain't that big. I'm thankful you don't all show up on the same time. But the truth is, it's a wonderful time. Why? Because we get to know each other. We get to fellowship with one another. And what's in Brother Ken can be transferred and we get something from Sister Kelly. We get stuff from each other. That's how this thing was made. That's why he said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Even more so as you see the day approaching. Why? Because we need him. We can miss him. We need to come because we are the body of Christ. I cannot love God and not love you. I cannot have a relationship with God and not have a relationship with you. That's the way it was designed.
It was designed that way. He made it that way because I can't get it all just by myself. There's some things I'm not going to get. It's amazing that I don't get until I get with you. He said, assemble yourselves together. Think about that word assemble. What do you do when you get, go to Walmart to buy your kids a new bicycle? You say, I want that one. I want that one. I want that one. I'm going to go in the back and get it. What does it look like when they bring it out? Does it look like the one up there with the little pink streamers and the, the, the defining dory on the seat? No, it's in a box. I, I didn't pick that. I picked that. Some assembly required. There's some assembly acquired. Assemble yourselves together. You see, one's got one part, one's got another part, one's got another part. He said, one's got a word, one's got a psalm, one's got a song. And we bring this together and the body starts assembling. That's why you feel that in the house. And if you don't feel it, then let's just all go home. And I'm not saying it's all about feelings, but if Jesus is not in the house, I'm just not interested in doing it. Because I'll be laboring in vain. We'll just build another church, put, another, put together, and somebody will be the preacher. And somebody. I'm just not interested in doing that. There's, there's so many wonderful churches out there. Just, just go find one. No, I, Jesus needs to be called this thing, be a part of this thing, be at the helm of this thing. And because when we come together, we're going to get the power to go out to tomorrow and do what you need to do. Not just tomorrow, when you leave here. You can come in here burdened about your bills, just like John. And because of his testimony, you can go, God, you're probably up to something. Not probably, you are. Do you believe that? Do you believe he's really orchestrating things on your behalf? That he's even interested in playing for your plumbing? I believe he is. But we can miss him. Let's don't miss the master. I said these strangers were blessed by the misguided priorities of the family. The people, the Jews, had their priorities off. They were too worried about their cows and their land and their spouses. And so but because they were, their priorities were off, who got blessed? We did, the Gentiles. We got called into this thing. Don't miss the meal. I want to say this. I put this down. It was, I said, I want to make feeding me a priority. Make feeding yourself a priority. If you can't get strong, how can, if I don't have it, how can I give it? You ever notice on an airplane how they'll say, in case of cabin pressure loss, there's going to be a little drop down. And, and it says, um, put, if you're traveling with children, please put the mask on yourself before you're tempting to put it on a child. Well, that sounds a little selfish. Really? Why do they say that? Because kids don't want those things on their face, do they? What are we doing? Shut up. Just do it. I don't want it. And they're struggling, pulling it off, and you're over there. <gasps> and both of you are lost. Put it on you. Then you have plenty of oxygen to help fool with them and wrestle that kid down and say, because we're going to crash. <laughs> because I said so. <laughs> Slap! Knock them out. I don't know. Whatever it takes. Because <laughs> you love your kids. Whatever it takes. I see the God do not to us. Whatever it takes. Bam! John, wake up. <laughs> no. Whatever it takes. Make feeding yourself a priority. Come get the meal. Get the nutrition. Get down before you do anything else. Get it for you. Because if not, you're going to pass out. You're not going to have the strength to deal with those ornery kids and spouses and bosses and employees and life. Don't miss the meal. Don't miss the master. Don't miss the meal. He has prepared it. You need to go eat. Take some time to get in the word. Eat some daily bread. I don't care if you have a few minutes. I don't care if you have a daily verse on your phone, and those are okay, but don't get so reliant on that that you don't pick up the Bible and see what was before that verse and what was after it. And he might give you something that the commentary didn't give you. I like to get my own commentaries. I love what other people do, but I'm going to tell you something. When I do my scriptures, I don't go and Google what other people say. Not, be, not because I can't add to it and I may later, but the truth is I want fresh bread. I want, what, what do you want to say to me? I, I, I believe God has given more light. 
See, I, I love to read the old folks. I love to read it, and that's good, but I'm not stuck back there. See, I believe the broader the light, the, the closer the coming, the broader the light, and there's more revelation being given. And just because my forefathers had wonderful things doesn't mean they had all truth and nothing but the truth. They had some things off and they had some things lacking. That doesn't make it bad. I don't care what's your history, what religion you come out of, or if you haven't ever been. We all are hopefully growing. I say I reserve the right to grow. Sometimes this might be a week. I might say, you know what, last week I said that, but I found out that wasn't quite accurate. I'm not too big to say I'm sorry and I had it wrong. Because why? Because I want to grow. It's okay to do your best and not have it all right. Because God is looking at my heart. He knows I don't want to miss it. He knows I love this truth. I know I had somebody come to me. I'd made some changes. I'm like, well, I'm just fearful for you. I can't believe you're doing that now. You used to teach against it. I'm like, look, let me just tell you, put your heart. I love your heart. I know you're concerned about me because I've been there. But I said, let me tell you something. I have the fear of God. I really do seek my God. I fear God for me more than you probably fear God for me. So pray for me. And if I'm off, let's pray that God will correct me. If not, it's going to be hard on me because it's not going to be hell's going to be hot because my God loves me enough to straighten me out right now. He's not waiting to the end and trying to straighten me out. No, he's going to straighten me out right now. And we've been talking about the judgment of God, haven't we? He judges us daily, daily. Judge me that I'll be not judged. That means he's making decisions. And sometimes he puts me in the fire to purify me. It's all through the Bible. And so I know one thing. My father loves me and I'm seeking truth and nothing but the truth. And if I'm off, I believe, I trust him. He's going to show me. And if he don't, it's going to be hot, hot, very hot on me because he will take me to a place that I can seek him with all my heart. I believe that. That's what Brother Hamby says. He said, the way you get revelation is when your love of truth supersedes your fear of deceit. Your love of truth supersedes your fear of deceit. I am not afraid of deceit. I love him and he is light and truth and in him there's no darkness and I seek him. And Lord, I want more of your truth. I don't care if it goes against everything I've been taught. I have to know what you want because this is me and you. I'm working out my own salvation with fear and trembling. That's my job. That's me and him. And that's why I want to be able to not, I don't want to miss him. I don't want to miss the meal because I need to have it. Not only for my own strength, but I need to have something to give you. How many times, it's very rare that I don't, when I read in the morning, I call it breaking bread. Before the day is over, I'll find somebody I'm talking to. I go, you know, I was reading this morning. Or I was watching this preacher this morning. Or I was listening to a song this morning. And before I know it, I'm sharing that bread. See, I got it, and I'm like taking a little piece off and telling you about it. Now, you might not get as excited about it as I do. You ever had a scripture like, oh, my goodness. Gary come in and go, man, look what the Lord showed me. Oh, my goodness. And I had to be real careful going, because we can say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good one. I, I learned that 10 years ago. That really deflated him, didn't he? <laughs> well, I won't share with you again, Miss Know-It-All. <laughs> We can do stuff like that. <laughs> I'm sure I've never did that, baby. <laughs> you ever get really excited about it? They're like not near as excited. Are you like, this joke is so funny? And you tell it, they're like, because <laughs> it was your joke. <laughs> it was your word. It's yours. But I promise you, when it's in you and the word gets in the house, and the word, and it, you, all of a sudden you cannot help but start telling people. And you know what he says? He said, if you will lift me up, I will draw all men into me. You don't do the work. You just brought it, you broadcast it. Let it be known abroad, like he said, that Jesus is in the house. When you start doing that, he starts doing a work. And people that you never dreamed that could be going, I want what you have. Can I go to church with you? Not because they see you be all perfect all the time. No, they see that his mercy is perfect toward you. They see that he still loves you and that you love him back in the middle of your stuff. So don't miss the, the, uh, the, the meal, but also that I've just been talking, don't miss your mission. Don't miss your mission because when you get the master and you get the meal, the meal is nothing but the provision for the vision. It's the provision for the mission. If you're going to go out and do it, you need to have something. Like I said, you can't give what you don't have. So you got to get, you gotta get, your, get that meal, and that's your provision for the mission. He said, in Adam and Eve, in the very beginning, what do you tell them to do? 
Be fruitful and multiply. That's the mission. He told the same thing to Noah when the, him and his sons got off the boat. He said, go, go be fruitful and, 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 and multiply. He told that to us. We are to have fruit, aren't we? The fruit of the Spirit. That's what we do. And it's that fruit that draws people to us. And Shay brought us the tree thing. We use it all the time. I had to give you credit because you're in the house. I usually just act like I knew that. But uh, <laughs> that, that God, he made us trees. He made us fruit trees. He called, he, called, he, uh, he, he used that analogy that a man is trees. And we're, we're trees of fruit. He talks about several places. And trees do not take their fruit and run around and just throw it at people. Can you imagine walking a road and this, limb, this tree limb just slams off and the apples hit you in the head or pears? And what? Well, this is not the Wizard of Oz. It's a faker. Fearful faker. So, fry by fruit? Oh, thank you. But it's not fly by, <laughs> dry by fruit. You don't throw your fruit and hit people. You just stand there and let your fruit be seen. And people walk by and go, wow, I need some of that fruit. I need some peace today. I need some gentleness today. That day's been pretty hard on me. I need some mercy today. I've been pretty hard on the day. I need some faith. They see it on you. That's the mission. I cannot be it. I, I cannot give it if I don't have it. I have to be not just do. I don't have to do. The mission, when I am with him and I have the meal and he is inside me before I know it, I'm producing fruit because it's his fruit. It's not my fruit. He said it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the Spirit's fruit. See, I used to try to just squeeze out some fruit. Uh, I got to have some gentleness today. I don't want to be gentle. <laughs> some mercy. <laughs> no. <sighs> Relax. It's him in me. Father, you know we just had an argument. You know I just failed on this. You know, but Father, you're in me, and I'm so glad. It's you. If I'm going to do anything today, it's going to be you that do, does it. He has given me a mission. And let me say this. Some people think that their destiny is somewhere out there. It's some accomplishment. It's like, you know, you have the kids, you know, and they're like, when I just get to be a teenager, life's going to be awesome. I should be 13. Woo! Okay, that came and went. 16. Ha <laughs> ha! We're going to get the car. Woo! License, freedom. Okay, well, that didn't work too good. Okay, 18. I'm out of here. 18. 21. I wish I were. <laughs> well, at 25, my insurance will go down. <laughs> you started getting real. I wish I was. You see, your mission is not something way out there. Amen. Your destiny is not some point. I don't know if you've realized it or not, but your destiny is right this minute. Amen. See, I believe it's part of your destiny for you to be in this service today. Do you believe that? Because, see, when you give your life to him, he says, now I'll direct your steps. Now, it doesn't mean you have to do it. He's, you're not some robot. He's like, you've got to do this. No, but he is right there leading you, and he's guiding you, and he said, right this minute. You need to own that. If you don't, you'll miss it, thinking one day when I get my ducks in a row, one day when I've done this, it's like the kids, when I get to be 13, 16, 18, we do the same thing. When I get my bills paid off, well, when I get married or when I get rid of this one or when I get this or that, then I can work for God. He's like, no, wherever you are on your journey, wherever you are on your journey, that's right where you're supposed to, that's your destiny right now. Today, there's somebody that you can smile at. It's somebody you're going to say, I'm really glad you're here. I've been missing you. Or I'm glad you're here. Maybe this is going to be your church. If you do, we want to know you. We want to get to know you. We want a fellowship. We want to do Monday nights. We want to do marriage mindset. We want to do singles. We, we have so many gatherings. See, we don't do a lot of church in the house because I don't want you to get the image that this is where your destiny is. It's all about now. No, it's about y'all gathering at McDonald's if you need to. It's you gathering around somewhere on a fishing bank somewhere. It's the fellowship of the brother and becoming family. And I want to tell you, pursue that. If this is your church, do not let, don't sit around and wait for people to come and befriend you. The Bible said, and they probably will, but don't wait for that. The Bible said, if you want to have friends, go show yourself friendly. Instead of waiting for somebody to invite you to house, invite them to your house. Well, I, I don't have a good enough house, okay? Then, then invite yourself over to their house. <laughs> 
Come over to my house on Monday nights and we'll get to, you get to know some people. I open my house up on Mondays. Let's start together. Let's pursue this thing. Don't just say, well, I've got Jesus now. Everything. No, that's just the beginning of getting born again. And then the work starts. Now it's the renewing of the mind. And you need each other. You need the body. You need Christ, which now is the body. Don't let yourself get, y'all know this, the minute you start feeling condemned about something, or you start doing wrong, what do you want to do? You want to isolate yourself. Well, I'm just not going to come to church. Well, I'm not going to come on Monday. You, I get worried. I'm like, hmm. See, that's the enemy. He's a liar. He knows that his only way to win is divide and conquer. Because when you get together, we're going to encourage one another. We're going to feed each other. You're going to have a meal. You're going to get strength. You're going to be a part of the body. And you'll be able to get up and go, wait a minute. I have a mission. I, this is not all about me. And this is not about woe is me. No, I've got something to do. Even tonight, it might be coming. You might drag in this house being the lowest man on the totem pole. But you're the one that night's going to say, I need help and I need prayer. And everybody else is going to rally around you. And we're all going to get lifted up. There's a saying, I think mama used to say, when, uh, did I tell y'all my mother's in the house today? I've got distracted while I go. The one and only Aunt Connie Perry of Texas Country Gospel. That my, my mother is, I wish she'd sing for us today. But you know what? She used to say, okay, now I forgot what you said. Help me, mama. Help me, mama. Whatever it was, it was right. Hey. I know what it is. I'm not sure she said it, but I think she's going to get the credit for it today. When you're down, you need the church. And when you're up, the church needs you. Sounds like her. If she didn't say it, she should have. I know she said it. She repeated it enough. She will now. When you are down, I don't know what's wrong with my memory today. I'm going to get distracted because I'm having to preach in front of my mama. But the truth is when you're down, you need the church. When you're up, the church needs you. So, you know, we're going to come in the house. Not everybody's going to be up the same time. Not everybody's going to be down the same time, hopefully. It's just the way it works. We have mission. We have purpose. I usually put about 20 scriptures on the board today. I didn't do as many, but I want to say that just Gary's favorite here. I'm going to run through these. Jeremiah 1 and 5. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you and I ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. I don't know what he has in you. I don't know what all your mission is, but it's not just a place. When he come out of his mother's room, he was already a prophet. He was a little boy. I don't know if he wouldn't get him saying, thus saith the Lord. No, I guarantee that child was speaking inspired words. Prophecy is inspired words. Sometimes it's telling the future, but it's inspired words for the moment, for the future, whatever it is. It's God breathed. It's not what I learned. It's not my intellect. It's not those things. It is God's ordained. He, 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 uh, he already said before you ever came in this world. When Gary got a hold of that, it helped him overcome his past. Helped him overcome the things that was said to him, like you ain't going to mount to a hill of beans. You're going to be just like your sorry daddy. All the things that he heard was told to him. He overcame it when his mind, when he realized, it don't matter what they said about me. He got a meal that took him, got him today. No, I was called. I am not what they said. I'm, I am what God says I am. Before I was ever formed in my mother's womb, God had a plan for me. Every single one of you, he has a plan for you. And it's today is your destiny of what to do with that plan. It's not somewhere in the sweet by and by. It's today. Even at your lowest, you're going to help somebody. Today, you have a destiny. Today is part of that. Ephesians 2.10, bring it in the New Testament. He said, we are his workmanship, created in Christ unto good works. I mean, we've been talking about good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He already before time ordained things for me to do. My good works are not to be saved. We already know that. I'm not saved by works. But because I am saved, I'm going to do some good works. If he's really in my house, I'm going to do something about it. People are going to start knowing when I'm filled with this joy, you cannot keep it back. It'll be noised abroad that something happened to Pam Weeby. And so before I am... And I love the workmanship. He's still working on us. That just means you're a work in progress. Quit looking at each other and quit looking at yourself about what you're not. And start saying, I have treasure in me. I am a child of God. And he put something in me before I was ever in my mother's womb. And he foreordained me to walk in him. And if he did it, there's nothing to stop me. Even my own failures cannot stop me if I remember that. So Titus 2.14 
Titus 2, 14, who gave himself for us that we might, he, he might redeem us from all iniquity. He redeemed us from that. He took us from our sins, right? And then he said he's also going to purify into himself. In other words, he's forgiven me. Now he's cleaning me up. Now I'm being renewed. That vessel's being made now clean. He says that I can, that I can be used for every good work. He said, purify to himself a peculiar people. That's what he's doing to you. Even if he takes broken sewer lines, he's using things, broken marriages sometimes, broken hearts, broken things that men break, things that happen in our life. Even all those things, he will take those, those twistedness, iniquity is things that twisted in us, wrong thinking. He said he's going to purify himself a peculiar people. That means a unique people. A called out, zealous of good works. That means you just can't help but yourself. You go tell people, Jesus is in the house. Jesus is in my house. My body, he's in me. He's in my, also my physical house, and he's in my church. I want you to come and meet Jesus because he can heal you of all of your diseases, of all of your sin. John 12, 32 said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. He was t speaking of himself. If you will lift him up, he will bring people. 2 Corinthians 5, 18. Of all things are of God, who's reconciled to himself, us, by Jesus Christ, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He reconciled us, now he gave you, Robin, responsibility to go out and reconcile something. That means bring people to the house, bring people to his presence, that they can meet the master, that they can eat the meal, and they can find out that they have mission. That is the whole purpose right there. If one more scripture, 1 John 4, 17. He says, our love is made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. What day is that? The day of judgment there means the day of decision. When I'm making choices, I'll have boldness when I need to make the right choice. I'll have boldness in my day of judgment, my day of decision. Because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. You need to see yourself as important. I'm a child of God. The song said, as he was in the world, I'm in the world now, reconciling the world back to himself.